It's a great privilege to, uh, to be here. Thank you to AIP, uh, Sir President, for uh, inviting me over. And I'd also like to thank uh, Boise of T Squared for inviting me to speak at this uh, very prestigious conference. I'd like to uh, start off by having a disclaimer that I'm not a structural engineer. I am, uh, so please don't take it against me. I am an architect and a planner by profession, uh, practicing in the Philippines. I work for uh, one of the, well, the largest real estate development company in the Philippines, uh, Ayala Land. And uh, our company is into uh, various types of developments, uh, various forms of residential from low-end low to high-end. We're into commercial developments, offices, uh, retail, uh, retail buildings, as well as hotels and resorts. But something that uh, we're most known for and what we're proudest of is uh, being the builder of cities, of central business districts, and of township developments and estates. Uh, the financial district of Makati, for those of you who have uh, had a chance to visit the Philippines, uh, the financial center or the financial capital of the Philippines is called Makati. And uh, I work for the company that uh, developed Makati shortly after World War II. And through the years, through the decades, our company, Ayala Land, has been developing a lot of these mixed-use townships, uh, commercial districts, and, and uh, mixed-use estates over the years throughout the Philippines, uh, around the capital of, uh, of a, met a capital metropolis of, uh, called Metro Manila, as well as uh, in other uh, provinces throughout the Philippines. So some of them are here in the slide. And so we pride ourselves as a uh, being a builder of cities. Now, I thought that that would be a good context in today's, uh, today's session since the conference is all about uh, uh, tall buildings. So why do we build tall buildings? Because you know, tall buildings is actually rooted on urbanization. We need tall buildings because we continue to urbanize, because cities remain relevant in our civilization. So why are cities important? Uh, most of you already know some of these uh, basic facts because 50% uh, of the world's population currently live in cities. They uh, are able to generate 80% of the world's uh, GDP. Unfortunately, they also produce 70% of carbon emissions globally. So that's how significant cities are. And uh, some urbanists predict that by 2050, uh, two-thirds of the human population will be living in cities. So that's, uh, that's how critical cities are in, in, our, in our civilization. So if you look at it, uh, tall buildings has to do with densification. It has to do with being able to accommodate more people in compact geographies. It has become very glaring always heard the term uh, mega cities. So those big circles that you see there represent cities with over 10 million uh, people in them. And you will notice because in the past, uh, most of these mega cities occurred in the first world nations. But you would see in the map that they are now occurring in the developing world, a lot of them actually, in, uh, in Asia, in Africa, in India. Those are the fastest growing uh, mega cities in the world, and this next slide uh, highlights that point. Uh, in the 1950s, those red lines there represent the cities where the high population uh, areas are. So they were concentrated in Europe and North America. But over the years, they've started to grow in South America, Africa, portions of Asia. And more recently, you can see that they have risen dramatically in all of these developing nations. This other slide actually shows uh, negative growth. So those yellow circles represent where urbanization is actually declining. And they're occurring in the first world nations. Whereas we're seeing a rapid increase in densification in the developing world. Now, it is also a fact that in the developing world, we're infrastructure and services are not able to catch up as quickly as the rate of urbanization. So therein lies the challenge. So we would see in places like this, this is actually the urbanization rate 
burnt out in various cities. So unfortunately, this, this map doesn't show the rate of urbanization in, in Bangkok. But in Manila, you will see that about 29 people per hour go or move into cities to live there. Uh, whereas in, uh, and you can see even higher rates in places like uh, Africa or India. So you can imagine on an hourly basis is the number of people that move from rural areas to urban areas. So that's the magnitude or the gravity of the challenge uh, us designers, planners. We have to accommodate all of these people that are flocking into the developing, uh, developing world. So some challenges of uh, urbanization and densification, which on a, mi on a micro basis we have to respond to in terms of how we design our buildings. First, we have to uh, find that balance between density and the infrastructure that will serve it. Also, how to, move, how to move people around, density and mobility, and how we are able to uh, have an equitable distribution of services, inclusivity. Cities are not just for the rich. In fact, cities thrive because they are for everyone. And then, coping with technology, as mentioned earlier, and how to build community with density or with, uh, with tall buildings. And then, balancing the built environment with the natural environment. And of course, creating a livable city in spite of the increasing density. This one uh, highlights the challenge between social equity and the rate of urbanization. This is a picture actually of uh, the Philippines. Very high urbanization rate, more than 20 people flocking into Metro Manila on an hourly basis. So very high urbanization is a global snapshot. But you can see that, that uh, there is also an increase in the urban poor uh, population. Uh, and so while uh, cities contribute significantly to economic growth, you see that kind of uh, contrast. We're in very vibrant economy, and yet uh, uh, there is that kind of the, the slum environment that naturally happen, particularly in the developing world. Another impact of very rapid of urbanization in the developing countries is the, the breakdown of infrastructure, the inability of uh, infrastructure to cope or to provide the right level of services with this rapid influx of, uh, of people from rural areas to urban areas. So this is a typical situation uh, in Manila. We, there's no more peak hours actually in terms of traffic in Manila. It's happen it happens the whole day. This is nearly a constant uh, scene that you see in, uh, in Metro Manila. And uh, sometime last year, we were actually voted as having the worst traffic on Earth uh, in CNN Philippines uh, through a survey done, conducted by Waze. So it's not something that we should be proud of, but it, highlights the challenge that is confront, confronting us, us, uh, you engineers, or us planners, how do we really cope with this? We can continue to design tall buildings, but these have to be responsive to the challenges of urbanization. So why do we continue to densify in, in spite of all of these problems brought about by cities, or the lack of their ability to support this densification? Firstly, cities are very efficient. People go to cities because it makes sense for them to do so, or it makes sense for us to develop cities. Uh, a professor uh, from Santa Fe, uh, California, did, he's a, actually a physicist, and he, uh, he uh, studied hundreds of cities throughout the world, and found out something that is almost intuitive, wherein there's three really economies of scale in, in cities. So for every person that, that lives in a city, uh, every person that you add, you don't necessarily have to uh, increase the level of services at the same rate. For instance, uh, you don't need to provide schools at a one-to-one -one basis. There are efficiencies. And his, uh, his analysis reflected that there's a, a new decrease 
the number of infrastructure required to support the population by 15% as it grows. So there is that kind of efficiency as you scale up. And second, and probably this is uh, something that's more significant, is rather than this linear scaling you know, or optimization or, uh, or economies of scale, there is that exponential level of productivity that as population density grows in cities, productivity grows. So the output in cities, the economic productivity, the GDP of cities increase as they densify. So if you double a uh, population, a city's population size, the economic productivity grows by 130%. Now, interestingly, even individual productivity, people who move from rural areas to urban areas experience individual prosperity and productivity because of moving to cities. And that's the reason why people continue to flock to cities. It simply makes, it simply provides a lot of opportunity for them to do so. And the cities themselves also grow in, in economic prosperity and therefore the whole nation also prospers as a result. But, you know, growth cannot be exponentially infinite, we all know that. The problem is, at some point, there is a potential decay or a decline. Because, again, there would be things like, things that could, uh, could uh, cause a city to, to decline over time. It could be conflict, it could be crime, disease, we have seen it through the centuries. Uh, much like any other organization. So past a certain point, efficiency starts to, to taper down. So what is needed, and what has also been observed, and since a topic uh, for this talk is really about innovation, is to avoid decline. Innovation has to happen at certain stages before such a decline happens. And we have seen it uh, throughout history. Civilizations and cities that have declined are those that weren't able to innovate so that they can adapt to the changes that are happening around them. And the ones that have survived through the centuries were the ones who were able to innovate. And that could be in the form of better infrastructure, innovations in terms of uh, you know, buildings, or innovation in terms of services. So uh, Typically, a disruptive innovation happens. A new type of economic model happens that allows a certain city to move on and progress before the experience decline. Now, in the case of building technology, why have certain cities managed, why have they managed to evolve from pre-industrial era to the modern state? Certain innovations in technology, such as building skyscrapers, new types of building materials, better methods of conveying systems, particularly elevator systems, and we'll have hear about that uh, later this morning, as I understand. These are the ones that help cities adapt to higher urbanization and accommodate more people. And by bringing more people together, it allows the entire uh, city to grow and thrive. Now, why is that? There was also a study that as cities grow denser. The opportunities for social interaction uh, becomes better, and that is what triggers the innovation. So many of you have probably read about how the Renaissance happened uh, after the medieval period. It was because of the convergence of people, great minds that flocked together in cities, a more liberal kind of thinking. And it's this exchange of ideas in cities allowed them to evolve uh, beyond the dark ages of the medieval era. So that is what's, what's important. So bringing people together to foster idea creation, more productivity, and individual prosperity. In the end, that is the role of, uh, of cities so that they can contribute more towards civilization. So cities can endure or avoid collapse or decline for as long as they foster human interaction that fuels creativity and prosperity. Spatial connectivity is important. As we design taller buildings and denser cities, mixed use, horizontally oriented vertical development, and I'll explain that a bit in a while. 
the reduction of in-city divisions, being more inclusive, accommodating, or providing something for everyone. Getting the right density and making sure that there's livability and creativity and urban social integration. So the challenge is in designing cities and buildings that can achieve these, uh, these parameters. Now, I'd like to talk a bit about uh, the challenge of social connectivity since that is, uh, that is very important uh, in making sure that cities continue to thrive and prosper. The challenge in tall buildings is uh, how can they continue to create social connections instead of isolation. Now, we know that in a typical building or a tall structure, what's important is what happens at the ground plane. That is where people converge. People living upstairs, which is always very exclusive and very private, once they go to the ground plane, that's where people on the street meet, those who are coming from transit, that's where the convergence happen, happens, and that's where the social connection happens. So the challenge is in making sure that the tall buildings that we design continue to support this type of uh, social interaction. And so uh, I would like to uh, cite two cases, that we, two projects that we have developed in Ayala Land uh, we've collaborated with some of the best uh, thinkers in the field of design uh, for these. Uh, two cases of tall buildings, they're not very tall, uh, but they are significant in terms of density and in particular how we believe they were able to incorporate ideas of connectivity, inclusivity, and good urbanism in their planning. The first of this is I had a triangle gardens. So we collaborated with SON as the building architect, AECOM as the uh, landscape architect and planner, and of course, uh, C squared as a structural designer. So this one, uh, this project, sits in the heart of the central business district of Makati, the financial capital of the Philippines. Roughly, that's the red is the boundary of the, of the central business district of Makati. Ayala Triangle is that green patch that you see. It's about six hectares in size. And it is the most prime commercial property in the Philippines. Now, out of those six hectares, there's uh, two hectares or about uh, for one third of the site that we have allocated as a privately owned but publicly accessible open space. Uh, and that is a, uh, you know, out of the own initiative of of our company to provide that. It's not mandated by law, but we felt that being at the center of the central business district, we felt that we had to give something to the to the citizens of the business district. And that's by way of uh, creating these two hectare uh, gardens. Now, uh, it is located, as mentioned, the literal heart of the city. We uh, So that's a picture of it. We use it for bar various business and international events, corporate milestones, the APEC was done there uh, uh, the, other, the other year, as well, as well as the World Economic Forum. We use it for exhibits and festivities, as well as for annual events, like uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll be holding our annual Christmas light show, the Festi Festival of Lights, which uh, is able to bring together uh, a lot of people coming from all over Metro Manila to view the light show, as well as other annual festivities. And then on a daily basis, this has become a convergence point by, by different workers in Makati. So before, uh, this was really just a fenced off area, but now you see people exercising there, we hold running events, we have, uh, we have cultural events there, but you know, it's always very nice that uh, you see office workers going there, but more importantly, families. So now, instead of in the past, where you see only office workers going to the gardens, now you see children or babies or people with their pets going there. So it creates that kind of community life, and that's what it's contributing. So when we were talking about, when we started looking at the next phase of the Ayala Triangle, so that's the garden area, 
we started uh, about in yeah, about two and a half years ago. Started conceptualizing the next phase of the development, which is this mixed-use uh, building, an office tower of about uh, 194 meters, uh, paired with a hotel building of about 100 meters, both sitting on top of a retail pool. The total GFA is about 160,000 square meters. And our challenge was really how to create that kind of social convergence. How do we build on the park? So our planners, uh, our designers, thought of a very inno innovative approach wherein the towers descend and create that you know, sort of like the transition space on the podium. So this is the retail podium. It sort of blends with the ground plane, with the park, like the roots of a tree. And that's how the ground plane meets the, the structures on top. So it, it's an extension trying to bring the social connection that's happening on the gardens, trying to bring it up to the building, at least at the, uh, up to the podium level. So that's how the, the, the buildings look like. That's the office tower, that's hotel tower, and that's the podium that uh, meets it the park, the park area below. Another view of that, so that's the garden area, and then the podium rising up to meet the towers above. And uh, this is an eye level view showing how those uh, buildings hope to create that kind of social interconnection so that people from the towers as well as the people that are on the on the park level are able to converge and create that kind of social connectivity. And uh, a dramatic view of uh, the office building when seen from uh, one of the avenues, one of the major avenues of uh, Makati Central Business District. The next uh, uh, the next case I would like to present is what we call uh, Juan Ayala Avenue. This particular project was uh, designed by uh, ADAS. Uh, the local architect is uh, Vision Art, and our structural designer uh, is the Boise of C squared. This one is a little di different. Uh, so what I was talking about earlier was this, Ayala Triangle Gardens. This other project is happening here. So it's about you know, less than a kilometer away from Ayala Triangle Gardens, but it is the front door to the Makati Central Business District. That's where it is. This is Fort Bonifacio. And for those of you who have uh, visited Manila, the main thoroughfare of Metro Manila is what we call EDSA. And the project site is right along EDSA, the main, uh, the main uh, transportation corridor of uh, Metro Manila. It's, it also has the heaviest traffic in, <laughs> in Metro Manila. So that's the site. So that's EDSA, the main avenue. Uh, it is part of our mixed-use development called uh, Ayala Center, our major commercial district. Uh, and it's right there at that corner, very important corner of EDSA and Ayala Avenue. And our plan, so that's the central business district of Makati, that's Ayala Triangle, and this is one Ayala Avenue. Now, EDSA is where you have not only the highest volume of pedestrian vehicles, but also it's where the public transportation happens, uh, buses, MRT, and all other modes of public transportation. So it's very congested. Now, our concept here is, you know, we are just a developer and we cannot solve the traffic problems of the metropolis. But owning this piece of property that fronts onto the major thoroughfare of Metro Manila, we felt that while we cannot solve the traffic problem in, the, in, in Metro Manila, we might be able to offer a certain level of convenience to the commuters, those who are trying to get the right to go home or get into work. We can probably do something for them. And so that's what we try to do. So that's the site. And there are about 300,000 people going to this intersection on a daily basis to catch a ride, whether by bus or by MRT. 
300,000 people every day. And so what we said is that's also our opportunity. We can actually create I mean, a better environment for these people, 300,000 of them on a daily basis, to catch a ride to work. So our concept was to create a, uh, an intermodal terminal. Create a new transport hub. <coughs> Organize the way buses and the MRT station would converge and allow people create a pleasant environment for the commuters so that they can queue properly in a pleasant uh, setting. So creating a new transport hub was, was key and central to the idea. As well as, since it's uh, at the front front door of the Central Business District, a new gateway and icon for the Makati Central Business District. And then creating that kind of freedom in the city, freedom in terms of mobility, not being constrained by the, the daily hassle of uh, waiting for a ride. Uh, and so, we created our commuter-oriented development approach, wherein, for a typical commuter, you just circulate vertically so that when you catch an MRT or a bus or jeepney or shuttles or even to go to parking, it's very convenient. And we're organizing the different transport modes, creating a venue uh, for them. We've allocated about 10,000 square meters just for public transit uh, facilities. Uh, including queuing areas and waiting areas for different computers as part of the development. So we prioritize the pedestrian by creating a better commuter experience. We wanted to organize a public transport and we want to encourage the shift to more efficient modes of transportation. So that diagram expressed into the actual plan shows this. So those are the different uh, the, the, the uh, What's shaded in purple represents the different modes of transport, MRT, buses, and shuttles. And then these areas are where the commuters or the pedestrians would, uh, would assemble, and then they move up and down to those various modes. And so that's, uh, that's where the transportation uh, hub happens. Around that uh, facility is where we start to stack commercial development, computer serving retail, for instance, and then offices and hotels and service residences on top of it. So the first priority in our development was creating a good venue for the commuters and then surround this with, uh, with commercial development that, of course, helps fund this entire project. That's uh, how it looks in diagram. So it shows the transport system, and that's the building code where we have the terminal and the commercial uses, on top of which are the other uses that uh, we plan for. This just shows where that central atrium area, so the buses are queuing at the street level. MRT at the second level in all of the commuters we created that uh, nice volume space so that it's a pleasant uh, setting for the value for all of the commuters that will be traversing this place. That's a view of that atrium. So this is where all of the commuters will converge and they either go straight to the MRT or go down to a uh, ride using the buses or the shuttles. The buildings themselves would, uh, are, uh, are intended to complement the mixed business district. That's a snapshot of the hotel that fronts into, a, into the park. And then the service residences, those are the offices as well as the hotel. This is the MRT and the main thoroughfare. See how it engages uh, the existing urban fabric. Oops. Yes. So I'd like to.
close by, uh, you know, with, with, those, uh, with those two case studies. So what are the key challenges and opportunities in developing tall buildings? First, we feel that connectivity can be achieved by designing tall buildings. And maybe that should be one of the priorities and uh, one of the opportunities as well as to uh, innovate. And then uh, tall buildings can also create a balance between built and natural environments, creating access to open spaces and parks. And tall buildings can be designed and built so that they can serve more people, be more inclusive. It's not tall buildings are not necessarily just for the rich, but they can create an opportunity to serve a broader audience. And the solution lies really in a different mindset that will allow us to innovate. We have to continue to think differently about how we design buildings so that they can create better or contribute to better urban environments. Thank you.